cool okay um so welcome everyone to um the third modern analytics webinar um this is the third and final one that we have scheduled in in this kind of mini series um but hopefully we'll have some more scheduled as we release more chapters of the modern analytics academy um today we're going to be talking about data quality um, and data quality testing um yeah so before we begin just a couple of um guidelines so we can make sure these run as smoothly as possible um if everyone can make sure that they're muted throughout the talks um that would be great if it's possible for you to have your camera on then please do we like seeing faces um especially if there's new faces which i think there's a few new faces today um we're going to spend kind of each speaker will have about 15 minutes um uh, chatting through their slides and then we'll have a dedicated time for questions at the end um so yeah if you have a question jot it down and save it for the end of the presentation um either you can write your question in the chat or feel free to just unmute yourself um during the question and answer session um and i can um yeah you can just ask your question like that um i'll be sure to send around a recording of um the presentation after the event um so yeah, if you haven't actually saved your spot or registered, um, you can do that on the Academy um, site and I'll, I'll be sure to send the recording around to everyone. Um, so yeah, the agenda for today, um, we're going to have Dan, who's head of data at Dataform, talking first. He's going to be speaking a bit about um, why we think data quality testing is so important and how you can um, take inspiration from software engineering um, and apply their kind of best practices to um, a data quality framework. He's going to be speaking a bit about the kind of five dimensions of data quality that you should be considering when you're writing um, data quality tests. Um, and then we've got Sean Pagado, um, who is product analytics lead at Cisco Meraki. Um, and Cisco, he leads a team of um, analysts there who are basically um, in charge of building and maintaining pipelines um, to give their organization reliable, up-to-date data. Um, and he's going to be talking a bit about kind of some real life use cases of how they built a data quality framework from scratch and the kind of lessons and challenges they encountered along the way. Um, we'll then have a Q&A session at the end. Um, so just for a little bit of context for people who um, are joining us for the first time, um, we've worked with various different data teams over the past kind of two years um, and have found that the most successful ones are adopting what we consider to be modern analytics. Um, modern analytics um, basically takes inspiration from software engineering um, and their kind of technologies and workflows and uses this to deliver um, the analytical outcomes demanded by modern organizations and companies. And we think that modern analytics is um, scalable, agile and collaborative. Um, so from kind of talking to various data teams over the past few years, we've kind of identified quite clear patterns in the way that the most effective ones work. And we took all of that information, which was inside our heads and decided to make it a bit more kind of accessible to um, everyone else and wrapped it up into the Modern Analytics Academy. Um, the Academy is in kind of lesson form at the moment um, and we launched it with four main lessons. Um, we started with the fundamentals and we hope to get um, a bit more kind of specific with, with the content um, as we go on. But we launched with an intro chapter, a chapter on um, moving from um, ETLT and ELT approach in your cloud data warehouse, um, a chapter on data modeling and a chapter on how to automate data quality tests, which is what this webinar is on. Um, you can subscribe to the Academy and get um, updates about webinars and new chapters straight to your inbox. And as part of the launch, we're, we're running this series of webinars. Um, we've done one for each of the chapters that we've launched, and this is the final one. Um, so yeah, I'll hand over to Dan now, um, who's going to talk about building trust in your data with automated testing. Great, thanks, Josie. Thanks for the introduction. Hello, everyone. I'm Dan. Uh, yeah, as Josie mentioned, head of data at Dataform. Um, I've been working for the last few weeks, I guess months now, on the Modern Analytics Academy um, with Josie and help from some of the others at Dataform. And 
uh, yeah, one of the chapters that I think we were most excited about writing was around data quality, something that I think is um, slightly new way of thinking for data teams, um, but actually also a real asset. And, and so we try to kind of bundle up all our thinking around data quality into, into this chapter and I'll cover some of it today in these slides. Um, and yeah, we're, we're going to run some questions at the end. So if you, if you have any kind of questions, we'd like to go into more specifics, we can definitely cover those afterwards. Um, so yes, if, if you've been coming to a few more of these webinars, you'll start to recognize some of the, some of the things I say at the start of talks, but they, the data team is very important to decision-making in the modern organization, as I think you're all probably aware and all like feel every single day. Um, and the kind of data teams, the, the data that the data teams provide is at the heart of decision-making. So if there is some wrong data, um, data quality is bad, then poor decisions can be made. Um, um, and even worse, if, if the data is wrong on multiple occasions, then the business team is going to probably just lose trust in, in the data and the data team altogether and, and stop using data to back decision making. So yeah, if, if, if they seem to have trust, then people are going to follow your advice um, and they're going to be led by data and want to use um, kind of the self-service analytics and BI tools you provide. But as soon as that trust is lost, then all of a sudden people are going to resort to gut feelings and, um, and emotions to make decisions and that's not a good place to be in. And unfortunately at that point, your business will have lost its competitive advantage. So I'm sure you're all kind of fully aware and um, on board with the idea that trust for the data team is really important. So um, I guess we should just all decide to not make any mistakes and then, then, then we'll be fine. Well, of course, this isn't really um, an acceptable approach, um, partly for the fact that the kind of the work we all do is data in, in, in data is really, really complex. And so just not making mistakes isn't really an option. Um, also kind of a, a, having a culture of fear within the, within the team um, around data quality is, is not great either. Um, if everyone's kind of scared of making mistakes, then the team's going to move really slowly. They'll be kind of too nervous about breaking things. And so they'll want to check, double check, triple check every, every single change they made, make. And unfortunately, if, if people are kind of worried about making mistakes, they'll also probably just become a little bit less ambitious rather than kind of trying new things and, and, and being really explorative. Instead, they'll kind of stick to what they know um, um, because, because they, they, just, they just don't want to make mistakes and don't, don't want to lead to data quality issues. And of course, this is not where we want to be. Um, being, in, being in the data team, being an analyst is all about moving quickly and feeling inspired to explore. And that's the environment we want to create. So what can we do as a data team to kind of accept mistakes, keep trust, but also allow our analysts to be free and move quickly? Um, well, it turns out we can look to software engineers for inspiration. Um, software engineers have been used to managing large, complex um, code bases where mistakes can be really disastrous, um, and they found solutions. So let's kind of think about what software engineers do. Now, this is obviously incredibly simple, but kind of serves to make the point that um, that I think we can learn on. This is kind of a, a standard software engineering process, maybe one from, from a good 10 or so years ago. Um, so imagine, imagine a software engineer following a process like this. Um, they want to release a new feature, so they make some changes to the code base. Um, those changes get released um, to their um, production environment. Software gets updated and released. The user finds a bug. Um, of course, they're not very happy with that. If we're lucky, that user would report the bug um, and then eventually the software engineer can make some changes. Um, this process isn't brilliant because the users have to be exposed to the bug before we find out that something went wrong. Maybe we don't even find out about it. And if we're really unlucky, people are gonna get fed up with all these bugs that get released and they're gonna stop using the product. Now, of course, software engineering has moved a bit of a way beyond this and it actually looks a little bit more like this. So what happens in a more modern software engineering process is some changes are made, those changes to code get released to the production environment. Sorry, those changes to code get released, then some tests are run. Um, if the tests pass, then everything's good. We can update the software and release it to our users. But if the tests fail, the software engineers get alerted. They can go and understand why the tests have failed, make some updates, you know, you know fix whatever bug it was that, that was in that initial um, draft release, um, release the code again, go through this loop until all of tests have, the tests have passed, release the new software to users and, and now we have happy users who don't experience bugs. And, and so of course, this is a bit of a simplification, um, 
folks can still get through this process. But the point is we've got this initial process of releasing code, making sure it's valid, running tests, going through a loop, kind of picking up on as many issues as possible before we go and release things to users. And um, this kind of basic paradigm is one that data teams can adopt too. Um, yeah, you may have heard this as described as continuous integration, this idea that you've got kind of automated testing being run as part of the uh, a process of releasing um, code. So let's kind of think about what this might look like for a data team. Um, it's, it's really not too different. Um, this time we have an analyst who wants to make an update to the data model. We talked a lot about data modeling in the last webinar. Um, so they, they make an update to a data model. Maybe they're adding a new metric, um, changing the way a dimension is defined. Um, and they add some tests as well to make sure that um, so make sure that we're testing that that metric or dimension is defined in the right way. They then release this new data model code. Some tests are automatically run. Again, if those tests fail, the analysts can get updated. They need to go and fix the test before, before any code can be released. Go through this loop a few times, make sure that all the tests are passed. And then we can go ahead and release the new version of the data model to our um, production environment, i.e. business intelligence tools, you know, reporting, dashboards, et cetera. And, that, and of course, we have the same happy business users um, using our kind of tested high quality data. So we need a few things in the data teams to be able to adopt this kind of um, way of working. Um, the first one is the development environment. So that, that loop that we go through at the start of uh, making some changes, releasing them, running tests, make, and then if they fail, go again. That obviously needs to be isolated away from our production environment. If every time we're running tests, we're actually changing the data that affects our, our dashboards and our reporting, then we haven't really solved our problem. We're still pushing bad changes um, to, to our downstream users. So the first thing we need to do is make sure we've got an environment where we can run these tests that's isolated from um, our, our business users. The second one is a testing framework. So some quick and intuitive way to define tests on data. I'll talk about that a little bit more in the next few slides. And then finally, we need some system that automatically runs the tests and reports on failures to us when, when they fail. So um, having these three key components together will allow a data team to follow software engineers and run this kind of continuous integration process um, uh, and keep data quality high. So that's kind of the process that we want to try and get to as a data team. Um, the next question is what kind of tests should we write? Like what, what is a, a data test? What does that look like? And for this, um, I think there are five dimensions of quality that, um, of data quality that are useful to think about. So I'll, I'll run through them now. The first is validity. So the question here is what is the data in a format that you expect? So this is pretty simple to understand. Um, for every kind of data set you create as a data team, you probably have some pretty good ideas of what, what that data should look, for, should look like. And so in this case, this example here, we never expect there to be a null value in our customer ID field or our email field. And if, you know, it, it just looking at that, I kind of know there's a problem there um, and, and something's gone wrong. So how do we test against it? Um, so it's pretty easy to describe the rules that we want to implement. On the left, I've written them down. Customer ID shouldn't be null, email shouldn't be null. And um, it's not shown in the example, but let's say we have some orders field that should never be negative. There's no such thing as making negative orders. So describing the result, the test is easy. It turns out that SQL is also a really good um, option for writing these tests. And so you can see here, what I've written is a SQL query that tries to look for bad data. So you may have heard of this kind of approach before, um, generally called assertions. So what I'm doing here is I'm writing a SQL query that tries to find bad data. If the SQL query returns any results, then I know that something's gone wrong. If the SQL query returns no results, then this is a data pass. So this is kind of how you might write a validity test um, with SQL that then you can kind of use and execute as part of your deployment process. The second type of data test, um, which again is, is pretty common to everyone, um, is uniqueness. So the real question here is, does the table have the right grain? grain or granularity. Um, and probably the easiest way to think of this is actually think of what, what does this look like when something goes wrong? When something goes wrong, you've got duplicate data in one of your data sets. Um, 
So it's, again, it's usually pretty, pretty easy to know which, by which field you expect your table to be unique. In this example here, I've got a customer's table. There should only really be one row for every specific value of customer ID. In this case, we can see we've got two rows with a customer ID 11. There's a problem here. Um, and you know, we want to make sure this, this can't happen. Um, so again, like describing that in words, it's pretty easy. There should have be more than one row per unique value of customer ID. And again, it turns out that writing a SQL query to test for this is, is, is nice and simple. So you can kind of see the query there, but I'm just kind of grouping by customer ID and counting the rows. Again, this query, if I run this and I get no results, this is a, a test pass. If any results are returned, then, then the test failed. Um, the third dimension of data quality that I like to think about is completeness. So the question here really is, are there any gaps in the data? So you'll, you'll probably have data sets that you create where you know that there should be data, at least some data for every day or hour or week or you know, something else. And um, the, the way that this can typically go wrong is if you have some ETL system that's loading data into your data warehouse um, that fails, then, um, then that, that might mean that you have some gaps like this in your data. So again, looking at how we could write assertions for this, this one's a little bit more complex. Um, the thing we want to check for is, um, in this example here, there should be at least one row for every load date in the past 30 days. And again, you can write a SQL query um, to try and find an example where, um, where there's a gap. If, if this query returns any results, again, this is a failure. Um, as long as we get no results back, then we can consider this a test pass. Um, the next one is timeliness. So the question here is, is the data fresh? Um, in a modern environment, new data is arriving all the time. You probably have streaming data um, in your data warehouse. Um, and making sure that that data is available promptly is kind of crucial to decision making. Um, if the data gets delayed, then you know that something's wrong. In this uh, example here, we can see that we were checking how fresh our data is and then all of a sudden it goes past six hours and now we know that something's wrong. So again, this one, we want to try and alert ourselves to this. Um, so here again, SQL query to try and check when the, um, to try and find a case if the most recent load timestamp is ever more than six hours ago. Again, if this query returns results, this is a test failure. Um, and the final one now is kind of thinking about comparisons across data sets, um, consistency. Um, so the question here is, do all of the data sets we create um, and share with our business align with each other? This is again, another pretty common data quality issue. One report says one thing, another report says something else. Um, that, that doesn't look good, we can erode trust. Ideally, we want to write some tests that make sure that if this happens, we get alerted to it before we release our changes. Um, so again, pretty, um, you can probably see what's happening here. Like writing this down kind of in words is pretty easy. Does the total revenue in one table always match the total revenue in another? And again, we can write a SQL query to test for this. If this query ever returns results, then this is a failure. Um, we, we want to be alerted to that. So with these um, five kind of types of data test, you, as the data team who understands your data models and the tables you create, you can start to think about how you might define some tests that can be run automatically whenever you make changes, whenever your schedules get updated. Um, Dataform um, as a product provides a framework to make all of this really easy. So you can just write these SQL queries each time um, you want to create a test. Um, in Dataform, we've provided a framework, um, you can kind of see in the top left image there, to try and just make it really simple to add tests. Um, we've also just made it really easy to define the tests that we have seen with our customers are the most useful. Those are testing for uniqueness, so testing the grain of the data, checking that fields that, um, that you don't expect to be null aren't null, and also performing kind of arbitrary ch checks on, on kind of truthfulness conditions for rows. So in this case, this example here, again, we're checking whether or not some orders field is uh, greater than zero. And if it's not, that would be a test failure. Um, so yeah, Dataform um, comes with all of these testing features bundled. Um, we connect to the Cloud Data Warehouse. We help you build isolated development environments so you can run your tests in a, in a way that doesn't affect your production data. Um, you can define tests with a single line of code. 
all of those um, tests get automated and run as part of scheduled updates. And if ever anything fails, you get a notification um, via Slack and email. So kind of armed with both a testing framework like data forms and these ideas of data quality and how you can test against them and your understanding of your data model, um, your data team can start to operate a little bit more like software engineering teams where tests are run automatically as part of the development process. So yeah, I, I, I strongly believe that automated testing is a really important part of a modern data team and setting, and setting the team up for success. Some of the things that we talked about um, at the start no longer apply. So now the team can move fast. They don't have to be worried about making mistakes. They, under, they, they have these automated tests to, to kind of um, um, to, to highlight problems when they arise. They feel empowered to explore. Again, um, you don't need to kind of stay into your own domain that you, under, that you kind of feel like you understand deeply. You can go and explore, again, knowing that this automated testing framework will make sure that data quality remains high. Um, and tests also work as a really good way of sharing knowledge across the team. If someone's written some tests about a data set, that kind of tells you what, what you should expect about the data. For example, the grain of the data set. Again, this is really useful for knowledge sharing across the team. And of course, most importantly, when you adopt a, a testing framework, you increase the data quality that you provide to the business, which builds trust and credibility um, from the data team with the organization. Cool, that is everything I wanted to cover. I will now pass over to Sean and we can, we'll do some questions uh, at the end. Thank you very much, Dan. Let me go ahead and show some of my end. Um, yeah, so, so Dan, thank you. Uh, thanks to everyone who's, who's joining as well. Uh, for everyone in the US, happy election day. Um, I'm Sean. I work at Cisco Meraki. I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit about how we use data quality testing here on my team. Um, but before I do that, I wanna talk a little bit about why this matters. Uh, I think Dan did a pretty good job at, at kind of outlining it. So I'm gonna try my best not to repeat a lot of the pieces he said, but I think about things, the way I think about it is you're only as good as your data. So you could have the most nuanced and sophisticated insightful analysis in the world, but if it's based on faulty data, it's kind of useless. Uh, now, okay, that's probably a little dramatic. No data you're gonna be working on is completely useless, um, but it is true that if you have data issues and you can't rely on your data, it's gonna take a huge hit to your team's credibility. Um, and this is something that, that's, that's actually surprisingly easy to happen. Um, I, I think Dan talked kind of in the abstract about it and how you can have uh, teams kind of lose credibility or kind of not look to your team to, to use data to make decisions. And, and that's true. I wanna give, give a more specific example of how I've seen this happen um, and what it can look like in practice because it sounds like, oh, that would never happen to me, but it's, it's easier than you might think. So picture this, you're working on an analysis. You, you've been working for a few weeks. You've been talking to the right people, figuring out how to pull the right data. And you've been crunching numbers and are starting to come up with something really insightful. And let's say you have something like this. The gray was the original data you had. And the blue is is some line you found to fit it. And for whatever reasons, this is, this is really powerful and important and will help your team make good decisions and, and figure out how to move forward. Very simple um, illustration here, but, but just, just pretend with me for the, sake of this, um, for the sake of this example. Now you've prepped your slides, you're in your meeting, you're talking to your execs or whoever it is that's, that's gonna make decisions based off of this and everything's going well. And then someone just says, What's that? What's the spike? What, what's that spike over there? What, what, what does this mean? And sure, if the only thing you were presenting was this one slide, you would be, any self-respecting analyst would, would know what the three spikes on their one slide are. But oftentimes you're presenting, you know, a, a dozen slides or a bunch of different charts. And uh, there will be pieces that are kind of orthogonal to the point you're trying to make. And you won't necessarily have time to look under every single last stone to understand every single possible idiosyncrasy of what you're working on. 
Now you can look at this and in your heart, you know, this isn't gonna really affect the overall point I'm trying to make. There's just this one spike, the broad trend still follows this blue line, um, but maybe maybe you have to go back and say, hang on, let me, let me take a look at this. Let me get back to you on that. Um, and even if that's true, that, that the overall broad point of your slide uh, is still correct, if this is a data issue, if you do eventually have to come back and say, hey, there was actually just a, a tiny bug in this part of the data, everything else checks out. Best case scenario, people understand and they say, cool, that's fine, no harm, no foul. But it's also very possible for someone to see that and, and take a little bit of a hit to your team's credibility. Uh, okay, well, if you know this was an issue, um, maybe they missed something else that, that isn't as obvious. Um, and kind of as Dan mentioned, the even worst case scenario is that there was an issue here and it's not just in this one isolated area, but it actually changes the overall point of the conclusion you would have made if you had the right data. Uh, and even worse would be if your team already went forward with acting on the decision you gave them when that ended up being not the right conclusion to draw from correct data. That would be super worst case scenario. And you know, as an analytics team, your job is to use the data to help your company, your business, your broader team make good decisions. And, and that would be the opposite of that. You don't want that. So if this sounds a little bit alarmist, I really don't mean it to be. Um, it just is pretty possible to have this stuff happen even when you're working hard and doing your best to, to take care of what you're working on. Um, but the reason we're talking about this here is that there's good news. This is pretty easy to fix. Data tests aren't hard to write. They're not hard to implement. Um, and they, they can go a long way to solving these issues. You don't have to worry about wondering if there are uh, simple mistakes in your data because you can just really easily write tests to, to take care of those things and make sure you don't have those problems. Okay, let me, let me kind of bring it back in and talk a little bit about my team and what we do. So I work for Cisco Meraki, Meraki um, owned by Cisco and Meraki works in the enterprise networking space. So basically if you think about the router you have at home, uh, Meraki makes things like that, things that you use to get online, get connected to the internet, but amped up and souped up. Your router at home might help you connect, I don't know, 20 devices. Um, but if you're a big school or a business, you might need something that can connect hundreds, thousands of, de of devices at the same time. And that's what Meraki does. Uh, Meraki also has a, a big part of it is their, what they call the dashboard, this, this easy to use user interface for managing your network. So for example, if you are a small school, you uh, might want to, not even a small school, if you're a school, you might want to block Facebook, block YouTube, things like that. And if you do, if you want to, you don't have to be an IT pro to know how to do that. You can do it through Meraki. Um, mostly suffice to say there, uh, the hardware organization is distinct from the, the rest of Meraki and I work in the hardware org and my analytics team uh, serves the hardware side of the business. So we're here to use data to help the hardware org make the best physical units they can. And that comes from everything in terms of uh, creating units that are as high quality as possible, that fail as infrequently as possible in the field, uh, helping the supply chain team make sure they know where units are in, in their supply chain and, and optimize that as best as they can, uh, to even trying to look at when units are being created, can we push the boundaries here or there or to save some money or no, we can't, we need to make sure that this works. There's a lot we can do in this space. We're still really just scratching the surface. Um, it's a pretty broad remit. It makes it, makes it one of the things, uh, it makes it one of the fun things about working uh, in, this, in this team. So um, I talk about this a little bit to give you a little bit of context to the rest of what I'm gonna show throughout, throughout this presentation. Um, we, we work with physical units a lot. Um, and what that means for our data is something pretty interesting. So here is a very high level view of our data. Um, the bellwether I think of for whether our team is uh, on top of our data is whether we can track one hardware unit across its entire life cycle. So from manufacturing with our partners through inventory into our warehouses, into the hands of the customer when they get it online. And then if they have to return it because there's something wrong, kind of going all the way back in reverse through that pro process. Uh, even monitoring things like uh, metrics while the device is on with the customer, like their uh, CPU temperatures or fan speeds. If they have 
high CPU temps and their fans are always running, that might be a sign that the system is overheating and, and might fail soon. Um, there's a bunch of different data systems that control each of these pieces and they're all created completely differently. And they'll have pretty different levels of not only granularity, but reliability as well. Um, so one of the things that we do is we pull these data systems together so we can understand our data uh, at a glance uh, beyond just looking at each system. Um, because we have so many different systems, it's important to make sure we're testing that everything is working correctly in each one. But also we use these systems uh, against each other to make our data as powerful as possible. So sure, some systems might, be, might have more data issues than others, but some uh, have issues that kind of start before the data. So for example, uh, on the inventory side, we can see places in our data when marked correctly, where it looks like a unit is recorded as arriving somewhere before it ever departed its departure. Um, this is just the way that the paperwork is filed. Sometimes paperwork gets filed a little bit late and all of a sudden, even if the data tables are capturing the data that's entered properly, they will com combine with the other pieces show up to be something impossible. So we actually use data tests, not only to make sure each individual piece of our data system is working properly, but to compare each data system to each other to make sure we can leverage all of them to be better than the sum of their parts. Suffice to say, we find testing really important. Um, what I'm gonna do now is give you a couple examples of, of the tests we've put together. Dan had some great examples. I wanna show you a little bit more of some that we use in action and, and how we've built them and, and why we find them important. So the first one here is very simple, just trying to make sure we have no illegal data. We have a table, we have a column in a table called stage and we use this table to, uh, or we use this column rather, just to take a look and see at a high level, where are our units? Are they still being manufactured? Are they in customer's hands? Where are they? And the process for checking to make sure that there are no issues with this is pretty simple. Um, you write this query and you say, show me all of the rows where the stage isn't one of our legal categories. It show me all the values where things are going wrong. And in an ideal world, this query returns zero results. That means your data is working correctly. You have no problematic rows. If you do have an issue, it'll return those rows and it'll be easy to see uh, exactly which rows are problematic and that helps you start to debug what went wrong. This seems simple, but, but we find this test really helpful. Uh, my team uses GitHub to manage all of our code and our code base, and we implement code reviews on them. Uh, a lot like what Dan was talking about earlier uh, on his side, describing a good process. And with code reviews, that means there's two pairs of eyes looking at everything, and that ideally minimizes all mistakes that come in. But nobody's perfect. So there was one point where we had a code review where we took, where a code change had a typo and the word manufacture um, had I think the F and the A flipped. So there was, there was, it was, it was incorrect. Um, and the code reviewer while, while going through the code, there were a bunch of other changes, didn't see that. Human, just human brains can easily miss the fact if two, if, the, if all the letters in a word are correct and two of the letters in the middle are switched, it's just pretty easy for the human brain to miss. Um, and so even in a code review that was missed, full disclosure, I was, I was the code reviewer on that. I missed it. Um, I remember distinctly looking and not seeing anything wrong. Just sometimes that happens. Um, fortunately, we have a test like this. And then as soon as the code runs the next time, the error pops up says, hey, there's an issue. And then we could see the rows that had the problem. And then we can see, oh, hey, this is actually spelled wrong. We can go back to our last CL. We can change it. Immediately things are back to being correctly fixed. Um, this is, this is really useful because if you don't catch that and then all of, a sudden, all of a sudden you wanna know, hey, how many units do we have that are currently being manufactured? If you don't know that you have a typo, you might not catch all of those, swaths of your data are off and then you're already starting to work with incorrect numbers. So seems simple, but it's actually really useful. Here's another type of test we use. This one's about completeness and is, is a little bit more uh, a little, there's a little bit more to it. So um, here, what we're trying to do is make sure that we have all of our data. Um, this is really useful because as I mentioned, some of our data systems are more reliable than others. So 
Um, the first thing we'll do is we'll take our tables that we know are reliable, that the way they're designed and the way they're used, they just have to have every piece of information in them. Uh, and so we take the serial number and then some useful columns from our source of truths and we pull them together into a staging table. Side note, we don't actually call our tables source of truth one and two, that's edited for clarity, uh, if that isn't obvious. But, but yeah, so we have our source, source of truth one and two. And, and so we get this serials staging table. And then we say, okay, show me everything from that table that um, isn't in the table that it should be in, that isn't in the table being checked. And if we see anything, great, then we know there's an issue. This is useful not for kind of a data problem, but for a process problem. Uh, we work with um, other companies and we have, we have other partners that supply us with a lot of the, our, our data. Um, and although a lot of the process is automated as we get data from them, sometimes those processes have to be changed a little bit over time. So for example, we might be shipping a new product for the first time and then someone needs to make sure that that product is included in, in the script. Uh, this test will catch whether or not that happens. And then we can know for sure, oh, hey, we're, we're missing something from you. Uh, can you go take a look and make sure that this data gets added? This, uh, this test actually trips more often than, 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 than you'd think or, or than I'd like, but, but it's good because then every time it trips, we can see, hey, there's something wrong and we can go grab the correct data. And then we can make sure that our data sets are consistently up to date and consistently accurate. And that's really important. The last thing you want when you're starting an analysis is to realize you're missing huge chunks of data and then you're just playing catch up from the start. You're looking around and you're trying to get your information um, and you wanna start crunching numbers for your analysis, but you can't because you've got to spend your time getting your data correct. Using these tests, you can catch issues as soon as they happen and fix them right away. So you're not playing catch up when you're starting to do analysis. So um, Dan did a really good job, I think, at explaining the different types of tests that you can do and kind of the, the total classification of all of them. Um, the thing that I want to emphasize here is that writing data checks is, is easy and it's cheap. And, and what I mean is all the tests you want to run are conceptually very simple. Um, completeness. If I'm supposed to have all of these things, do I have all of these things? Correctness. Is there something that's not allowed to happen in this column? And, and duplicates. If I can have, if I'm only supposed to have one of these things, do I only have one of these things? Like these are very, very simple concepts. And Hopefully from kind of the examples I've shown and the examples Dan has shown, um, it's clear writing those tests isn't particularly complicated SQL. You're often working off of your, your final tables where everything's already neatly together. And so it doesn't take much to say, hey, let me just count the number of things I have here. Is it one? Great. If not, show me. Um, the duplicates one uh, is special to me. Um, I remember in, in a former job in a, in a different project I was working on, uh, a project that was this wonderful combination of really time sensitive, a very error prone process that had zero room for error. Um, it involved the, the, the company's sales quotas and, and you really can't mess up sales quotas. So many people depend on them. Um, but, but the project when I inherited it had you no know, tests and a lot of code kind of written haphazardly and, and it was kind of chaos. And at one point, you know, you can look at a row and it looks like things are working properly, but, but the numbers weren't adding up. And at some point along the way, there was, a, there was an issue with either, I forget, an exploding join or, um, or a group by missing. And basically every single row was being duplicated twice. And so all of a sudden you had twice as much uh, data as you expected and, and all the numbers were wrong. But that's still pretty easy to check. Do I just have one of each? If I have a table that says, where are all my hardware units at this moment? I should only have one hardware unit, each hardware unit only represented once. Pretty simple stuff. They're easy to run, they run quickly. Um, so it, it just adds so much value that you can implement these into your process, make sure your data is correct uh, without adding a huge cost to do so. So uh, this chart is pretty overwhelming. Uh, fear not, that, that's kind of by design. Um, let, let me walk you through this. What you're looking at here is um, 
my team's data pipeline, essentially. Um, each red box is a source table. Each bluish purplish box is a script where we pull the source tables together or earlier scripts um, to create either a staging table or a final table. Um, actually, some of our final tables, there's one right here um, and another one down here. And then each orange box, each box with orange in it is a data test we're running. And so I show this for a couple of reasons. One, um, this is what a lot of modern data pipelines look like. There are a lot of tables you're pulling, your team is pulling from. There, is a, there are a lot of scripts that you're managing. And because of that, it's, it's, it's gonna be impossible to look at each table kind of independently or manually to make sure things are, are working properly. You just won't have the time. Even if you did, you wouldn't want to. It's, it's annoying and, and, and you can make tests that do that better. By having these tests that are running in the background constantly, you can make sure that, uh, that things, that any errors you have are identified immediately. Um, what's great about this is if you find some exotic new issue in your data, you can just write a new test once you resolve it and then catch it forever um, immediately when it happens. The last thing I'll say here is you might be in a team that doesn't have to build up data pipelines and maybe you work in a larger company that you have a team that creates data tables for you, great, and so you don't have to worry too much about testing. But even if you are on one of those teams, you are the analyst that is going to be using this data to inform and uh, inform execs, inform stakeholders in your company. You are gonna be the one on the line if the data doesn't work or if there's a glitch in it. If your analysis is faulty because of data another team put together, nobody's gonna feel bad for you and say, oh, you know, that's okay, it's, it's their fault, I'm not mad at you. They're, they're just gonna be upset that, that a decision was made that shouldn't have been made. Um, and even if there is another team building the tables for you, they're not gonna be the ones using it, they're building them. You are gonna be the one out there really engaging with this data and being able to have a sense of where there can be issues. So it's still a good idea, even if you're not the one in charge of building tables to have basic checks on the data before you use it to make sure it's solid. Uh, there, there's no downside to doing it. So with that, I, I'm gonna wrap things up and, and we'll move into the questions portion. Um, I just kind of wanna say, in summary, data tests, they, they protect your analyses. They make sure you have the right data. They protect your team's credibility. They're also really easy to write, easy to automate. Uh, very, very little downside. Um, basically not writing tests is a low risk, is a high risk, low reward um, thing to do. So, so it's really worth doing and I, and I encourage you. With that, I'll just say happy testing. Cool. Well, thanks, Sean, for that. Um, I hope everyone found that as useful as I did. I think adding some kind of real life use cases and stories to the kind of basic principles that Dan was speaking about was really useful. So thanks, Sean. Um, I'm going to open up the floor to questions. Um, feel free to unmute yourself and just ask away or um, you can write it in the chat if you prefer. But yeah, if anyone has a question, go for it. I have a question um, for either of you, I suppose. Um, like, what percentage of your time do you do you spend thinking about edge cases for assertions versus like accepting that some like rogue stuff can happen? Uh, like, how do you how do you kind of split your time? Because I can imagine there's like a bunch of edge cases that maybe it's not worth. Like, like how do you think about that kind of problem? Uh, I can go first, Dan, and then, I'll, then I'm curious to say what you say. Um, I don't know. I don't think about edge cases a ton. Actually, if anything, I find edge cases just more interesting just to think of like hypothetically what could go wrong and what kind of cool tests can we build for it. But tests, the tests that, 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 we, that we have written catch a lot of things, basically catches anything except for, you know, the values that you're allowed in, in the case of one test. Um, and so there's a, there's a sense of there can always be something strange that can go wrong and, and pass through all of the tests that you already have. And, and you kind of want to be aware of that. But if you can get, you know, 95% of issues pretty immediately with, with basic swaths of tests, then you kind of keep your eyes open for what else could go wrong. And if something does, 
you know, nothing will be perfect just because you write a bunch of tests. You still have to be there and be aware, but then you just be aware of that. And then when that happens, write that test and minimize that from happening. Yeah, I think my answer is probably pretty similar to Sean's. I think maybe there's a slightly different perspective to layer on, which is I, I would say I'm probably, I probably can't be bothered to spend more than about 2% of my time thinking about tests. And so um, what that means is that um, I'm basically just testing for like the most obvious things. Like I think probably most software engineers would probably feel pretty similar, which is like writing tests isn't the fun bit, writing the initial code is the fun bit. Adding the test at the end is really important, but it's not necessarily fun. And I think that's why one um, something that's really important is using a framework that makes it really like intuitive and easy to write tests. So kind of two years ago with Dataform, the only tests that were really easy to write were uniqueness ones, or that's kind of what I felt. And so I would usually add a uniqueness test to most things, partly because it was pretty quick, partly because um, I like that was always the mistake that I made, like you know doing a join and and not including enough fields in the join, boom duplicates, and it's like the most it makes you look the most silly as well. Like when revenue is double what it, what everyone knows it is like straight away, people are going to catch you up. So um, I think my kind of, my instincts is basically just to add tests for the things that are like really obvious to me. So like revenue shouldn't be negative. This field shouldn't be null. Um, if I'm like defining us, like Josie and I work together quite a lot on, on writing queries for marketing attribution. I often find myself writing pretty nasty case statements in marketing attribution instinctively i kind of know this is very likely to go wrong so i'll kind of you know i'll often like chuck in a test a bit like sean said it should only be one of these values or it should never be null um you know the there's like the tempting catch-all at the end of a case statement which you could just you know hard code a value in there that looks okay i actually prefer to hard code a null in the end there and then chuck a test in that that case statement should be never a null because it probably if I'm hitting the end of that case loop, it probably means I did something wrong. So long answer to your question. I'm more just adding the test for the most obvious things. The easier the framework makes it for me to write those tests, the more tests I'll write, but I'm probably never spending more than kind of a reasonably small portion of my time writing the tests. And I don't know, for now, that seems to, that seems to be enough as well. Cool, thank you. Anyone else have a question for Dan or Sean? Okay, maybe I will ask some questions. So basically, maybe to Sean. Uh, basically, um, I saw that most of your tests are at the end of the pipeline. So basically, they are on the you know, let's say uh, exp like the, the final result. Why you're not testing like the middle products? That's a great question. Um, thanks for it. Um, it's it's actually a place where we could start to add more tests. The the answer is we're still in the process of building out this pipeline. Um, the tests that I that that I want first are the tests at the end to make sure things are working. Um, but those tests can be less helpful if you find out okay there's a problem at the end. Where did it start from? Um, and so that's a part where we're building out and and we have some and we're definitely going to be building more. Absolutely. Uh, that that's a good idea and test shouldn't be just at the end. Thanks for that. Okay, maybe one more question. Basically, uh, I'm, I'm basically using the data form uh, for our uh, product. And basically, I am curious, how do you force Inca, uh, let's say, analytic, uh, you know, to, to run the schedule before like they, they commit to the master or, you know, to the main branch? Because like in our situation, sometimes, you know, we are forgetting about it. And basically, you know, we'll run into a situation that someone will land uh, without tests. Sure, maybe do you want to answer that question first and then I can answer it from a slightly more data form product uh, centric point of view. Um, so is the question specifically, how do we run the tests before we, so we, can, can you ask the question again? I, so, I think the okay. question, yeah, the question is around like, how do you make sure that developers or like analysts actually run tests before releasing their code to production, i.e. make sure that the tests pass before they actually merge the code. Um, another great practice that we're on our way to getting there fully. Um, my team is small and basically we're, we're just doing it kind of on the side more manually. It's not a part of our official processes yet, but definitely another part that I want to be there along the way. Um, yeah, uh, the ideal is when you're submitting a, a CL or, or basically a change in your, in, your, in your code that there are a bunch of tests you can already say, hey, GitHub, go run these automatically. I mean, 
right? Continuous integration. Um, there's, there's a name for it. Um, we're not doing that quite yet, um, but we're getting there. Yeah, and I guess the, um, the extension to that is it is possible to define um, exactly those like automated tests like you described as part of GitHub Actions. It does take a little bit of setup work. I do think we've got some documentation on that that you might want to check out. But but basically, the way that works is um, there you can use a Docker image to load the data form CLI, point it to that version of the code, um, pull pull down this new code, actually go and run, go and perform a run, and only if all the assertions passed allow the code to be merged. So if you're using something like GitHub or GitLab, you can actually completely automate this. At the moment, it's something that you need to do kind of yourself. I think the vision would be that Dataform has like something that you can just click a couple of buttons and have, have this all set up for you. But yeah, if you're interested in knowing how to, how to set the automated version up, let me know and um, on Slack or something, and I can point you to the docs and, and help you through that. Okay, thank you very much. Anyone else got any other questions? So actually, I have a question for Dan. Um, uh, so speaking of kind of like where things go from here, uh, Dan, you know, maybe kind of speaking from the data form side where you guys are, are putting this together and, and kind of thinking about this framework a lot more of, of how to build this stuff out. Um, where do you see testing going from here? Where, do, where, does, this, where does this grow? How, how do tests get better in the next few years? Yeah, so I think probably the, the, the first answer we've already been kind of pointed out by Camille. So like really tightening up the integration loop so that um, we make it really easy for you to say, do you know what? I actually want to block anyone from pushing any new code to a master if, um, if assertions uh, fail. So, so that'd be step one, like make that continuous integration loop a little bit tighter. Um, the second thing, as I kind of hinted to in um, my answer to the previous question was like, the easier the tests are, the more people write. And again, like as the kind of presentation suggested, we feel pretty strongly that the more tests the data team writes, the kind of the more likely they are to reduce high quality, release high quality data and, um, and, and, and essentially kind of do, do a better uh, job. So the next step is make it really easy to write tests. So I think we've done like the first iteration of that in data form, which is take, make it such that rather than having to write 10 lines of SQL, you can just add a couple of, like a single line to um, your config block. I think the next iteration of that is gonna to be to actually create like a bit of a UI for creating tests. So, you know, if, if all you wanna do is say, these fields should never be null, let's just give you a kind of click and point um, user experience for doing that. We'll of course store it as code and it'll be part of your PR and code reviewed just like everything is in data form. But I think we can make, we can build a user experience, a slightly nicer user experience for some of the easier tests. Um, I think the third piece, which is a little bit further out is um, around alerting teams to suspect data quality on the way in. Um, so this would be a little bit more in the realm of like anomaly detection. Um, but, you know, I talked about like the freshness issue, this idea that you probably have some expectations on when data is arriving. Um, data is pretty is well aware of the data sources, which your data model is built on. If we can see that um, for the last you know week, you received new data into this data set every every hour, and then all of a sudden, you, you know, 12 hours have passed and we haven't seen any changes to that data model. We, we can probably get smart about alerting uh, you, you to that type of issue as well. And those are, those are probably the types of data quality issues that at the moment in data form, are, I would imagine are probably the least well-tested, partly because it's not necessarily that easy to write those tests. I mean, it's possible, but not, not that easy. And so kind of moving into that like anomaly, anomaly detection realm, I think you'll see more of. Um, that said, I do. You, there's this huge risk with anomaly detection, I think. Um, Data testing works when you trust that you're going to be alerted to like real issues. If you're getting alerted to things that really aren't problems too often, then all of a sudden everyone's going to start ignoring all of the alerts and then, and then we're back to square one. So I think in my opinion, the anomaly detection stuff, you've got to be super careful and be very kind of wary of um, false negatives. 
probably have time for one more if someone has a quick one. If not, we can, we can end it there. No? Okay, cool. All right, well, yeah, I'd just like to say thank you to everyone for joining again. Um, we hope that we'll, each time we release a new modern analytics chapter, we'll run a webinar um, alongside it. And so, yeah, subscribe to the Academy for updates on new chapters and webinars, and we hope to see you at, at some future events. And thanks to Sean and Dan again. Thanks, Sean. Thanks, everyone. Yeah, thanks. Nice to see you. Thank you. Thank you. See you. Thank you. See you. Thank you. Thank you.